Yeah, we feel super honored to be here in Chicago and to work among one of the great architectural communities of the world. And it is also humbling. We have to be very, very uh, careful uh, with what we do here because uh, we're working in the shadows of all sorts of towering figures and, and special buildings and, and people today. So thank you. It's a huge honor. Because you guys really know here in Chicago. Yeah. And Stuart, thank you. I mean, that was, that was absolutely lovely, and, and thank you for not winging it totally. I would have winged it. I could imagine I could wing it. Uh, not um, wrong. So we thought we would uh, talk about interiors. And so... Yeah, yeah this reads, it's probably, the reality of the building does not consist of floor, and walls, roof and walls, but in the space within, Lao Tse. Uh, Billy doesn't frequently quote that, but... But Todd does. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we've, we've used this image before because it's, of course, the sort of dissection of Leonardo is probably a better drawing than was sold last night. Um, <laughs> and worth a whole lot more. Uh, that of the interior of a, of a human. We do believe that architecture does start from the inside out and after leaving Richards, we only had interior work to do and actually we still believe that interiors are the most fascinating and interesting parts of our work and we believe that our own interiors, our own uh, interior well-being is more important than the deterioration that occurs or the beauty that occurs on the outside. So we like to work on the inside and I Everyone knows the statistic that we spend about 86% of our time in, indoors, about 6 or 7% in the cars, maybe more here in Chicago, and about 6 or 7 actually outside. So our lives are spent inside. So we've been lucky to work in India, and one of the things that was really amazing to us were step wells, which actually have no presence above the ground. This is a section. And so people would enter into the slot in the ground and go to the bottom and at that time draw water, but it's also a social space. But we love the power of this kind of inside out building. And then of course, most of you know the work of Michael Heiser. And this is an installation at Dia Beacon. And it's incredibly powerful, it's a void. Um, and Actually, now you can't, they don't let you get very close to it. But the sort of power of a kind of negative space, the inside space, um, without necessarily making a, a kind of positive statement, the negative statement, is something that we found very, really um, moving. And of course, uh, everyone knows this in London. And I don't oh, totally love it, but it does have a lot to do with the way we live and the way we see life collecting uh, incredible number of artifacts and setting them up and being fascinated by them. So most of you know one of the images at least, um, which is from Goodnight Moon. So anybody who's ever been around a kid knows this book, but it's a very, very powerful interior and the whole world happens inside this red and green room. And as I was looking at it, I suddenly thought about this painting by Carpaccio, which is um, St. Jerome in his study. And one of the things that was always fascinating to me about both the good night moon room and the Carpaccio room is that the objects inside the room um, really start to tell you about the nature of the people or the bunnies that inhabit the room or study. And of course, here's Lorenzo Lato, and uh, another sort of sense of the intimacy that we all expect to have in our lives, the, the things we touch. Um, touch is tremendously important to us in our work. And one of the um, things and sort of touchstone that we go back to, speaking of touch, is this staircase um, that's in the house of Wharton Escherich, who um, is a sculpt was a sculptor and also a very incredible furniture maker. Well, this was his home outside of Philadelphia, which you need to visit. It also has a, an addition by Lou Kahn, which is pretty fascinating. But he, this stair is a favorite of ours, not only because it's a, a carved tree that is 
winding us upward, but it also has this diversion, almost a seamless diversion that takes us to another, uh, another place. And the temperature of the railing, which is wood in one case, changes to the temperature of, of bone on the next. So you actually, the temperature of what you're holding, even the form may stay the same or nearly the same, but the temperature changes. So the wood is actually let in to a mammoth tusk. And because the mammoth tusk is now very brown like the wood, you don't visually see the difference, but when you run your hand down the rail, you feel the difference. It's a very powerful difference. And Rianji, um, which has uh, always been for us of interest, actually Chinese, Japanese, and Korean gardens are all of interest to us. But in the Japanese garden, we like the thing that is actually concealed as much as the thing that is revealed. So in Rionji, wherever you sit, you can't see all of the rocks that have been placed in the garden at one time. This was, uh, we were lucky enough to go to see the stone, um, the churches in uh, Lalibela. Lalibela. Uh, and this, this is an extraordinary experience to see church car carved r directly into the earth and then to cut when you're way down into these spaces. It's, it's just astonishing. So in a way, the entry is not so different from the entry into um, the step wells in India because it's a slot in the ground and you find your way down to the bottom to a courtyard that has been carved from solid stone to a church which has then been carved really from the inside out. Interesting enough, we only visited those three years ago, but they've been more influential to us in the years before, they still will be. So we're showing five projects. One is the first is an installation, uh, and that is a snow show, which was done in the year 2000, so it's 17 years ago. Uh, we worked with Karsten Haller and we did another one a number of years later, but this is the idea of working with snow. Of course, you have a lot of snow, or did have a lot of snow in Chicago. This was our idea, which is to create a, a large a, a carving in the snow rather than a buildup of the snow. Um, and in this case, it was to take a, make a platform of snow, pack it down, find a small uh, space in the land in, in Finland, and then to, in a way, inhabit the, the, the space. Growing up in Michigan, I made many igloos as a child and uh, loved being in the space of the snow. But here the idea is once again a kind of negative space or carving out. Um, and as Todd says, it's, a, it's really about trying to be invisible but then creating a very powerful um, sense of enclosure once you find it. And it was interesting because in Finland there are actually people who are trained to uh, build with um, snow. And so they were cutting the snow blocks out and then forming them. We have a, a film of this. It was great fun to slide through the, through the snow and come out the other end, and then climb out of the space. So now we're only down to four. Um, <laughs> the second one is also a small project. This one, we decided to show things that maybe you hadn't seen before. This is a very modest project in Peterborough, New Hampshire. The Novel Colony um, was an artist colony, really the oldest in the United States. And um, if you're, if you, you can, architects can apply, by the way, um, but you can apply to go to the McDowell, and what you do is you're given a studio, and it's in the middle of the woods, usually, and you're there all day by yourself, and you, they deliver a picnic basket to you for lunch, um, and then you meet communally for dinner. So then for the length of the time, which is nearly 100 years, you'd go back to a common hall to have dinner. Uh, you would share your day over the over discussions, or there would be a small library that you would, you could go to. And this is the set the library. It's called the Savage Library, uh, built in 1920. It was a stone library. Of course, there are 26 people. At, well, I didn't say that 26 people at McDowell at any time, plus a few others. And so this tiny one-room library, which is certainly no larger than a third the size of this hall was too small and they had a fireplace in it. There was no uh, 
there was the door opened directly into the library and they had piano uh, and uh, lectures in that space. So we were asked to add on to that library. And uh, the library is uh, in the distance there. This is before it was built and this is our, our project. So one would have dinner in the main hall up in the upper right of the plan through there and walk through the woods to Savage Library here, the old library, and we decided to site our building respectfully behind that building. Uh, the drawings that Stuart says we do still, which are kind of working things out in plan and so on. So the idea here was that the library we can see is that kind of weird H-shaped space up on the upper right with the, and that was going to remain a library. And the idea of a library for the McDowell has changed over the years. And there were composers and artists and so folios and different video work and so on wants to happen in the space next door. Uh, so this became a vestibule to the library itself. There was a, a, a large rock, we decided to call that a partner in the crime. And then we also knew that they loved their fireplace, but they couldn't any longer have it where the books were. We needed to condition those books 100 years old. So we made a fireplace as a partner in the land of stone. So people in the wintertime or in the summertime go and gather for the fireplace and then have their meet in the library for a concert or discussion. So I think this project is really about being extremely quiet. Um, we're trying to be quiet and sit behind Savage. We're trying to be quiet and sit behind the stone. But we're not trying to be that quiet because we took the fireplace out and made it a kind of mast in front of the building. You also might say these are Pella or Duratherm windows. <laughs> uh, that, was a, that was a precondition of me coming here. No, uh, that's not true. Uh, we happen to love them and we are, of course, anxious about everybody's future. Um, so the, the interior we wanted to make feel warm as the stone needed to sit outside and we felt that that would work. So it's really a series of slightly shifting spaces. So there are many places to be in this, in this small library. You could pull the curtain closed and sit there and watch a, a film with a friend or two, uh, curl up in a corner, have a conversation, um, have a cup of coffee and uh, step outside. It's intended really to be recessive partner to in the vestibule to the Savage Library itself. Worked with Gary Hildebrand on the landscape, which is very, very simple to say the least, but using old pieces of stone that we found and trying to use local stone for the, the stone work. And because it's New Hampshire, they actually do use the fireplace um, a lot of times during people stay. This is the old library restored, um, the fireplace now not usable, and the new fireplace in front. The second project is, uh, uh, we, we actually feel great about this project. We've done several dorms over the years. The first one was at Princeton. Later we did dormitory at the University of Virginia. Now we're doing some at the Jewish Theological Seminary in uh, New York, but in 2013 we completed these dorms in Haverford. Haverford is a wonderful school just outside of Philadelphia, and it actually is an arboretum, and it's a small liberal arts school. Their belief in the landscape is very, very strong, and the red smear over here is the location of our buildings. Uh, students had been living in local houses there that had a, a housing development that sort of collapsed but they wanted the students on campus, and so we cited the buildings, the dorms, the first two of these dorms, in the place of a parking lot. And we first looked at the study of the, that was done for the analysis of the project, and they proposed that it was a double-loaded corridor like the one at top. And having done a few dorms, particularly one like that at University of Virginia, we were disappointed in our work and thought we could do better. We also were trying to think about how you could be radically simple. And part of that idea of simplicity has to do with um, also trying to save money. So but we found that you could create social space and circulation space and end up with a much smaller perimeter um, 
by making it feel more like a courtyard of rooms. Well, those students, uh, we've been given the assignment to do singles, doubles, and quads. Um, but the students, it's a Quaker school, they all voted to have singles. So that immediately created a problem for us, a cost problem. So we then looked at that. And then we also studied the site which we see at the top, which was on a very gentle slope, one in 20, which we know is an incline, not a real ramp. And the parking lot had been made as a flat parking lot using rubble. And so our idea was that if we could dig up the rubble from the constructed parking lot and rebuild the landscape, we could get two very, very inexpensive buildings, actually four buildings, they were absolutely identical that sat on top of one another. And so they were, didn't communicate with one another, and rather than have a fire stair or an elevator, you would use the landscape to move between the buildings. So we eliminated all fire escapes, all elevators, and we were able to use, once again, dirt iron windows. Uh, but we were able to build it at a higher level of quality than they expected, and it's been very, very happy because the students have loved it. So, what we see is these are the two blocks and the green thing is a kind of constructed landscape that allows you to incline up to the top and then to walk between the dorms. Now the kids had to agree that it was a good idea to visit another student by going outside, but that was their choice and fortunately they did choose that. So these are the sketches that we were showing them about what that would mean. The distance between these two, these were block buildings with brick exteriors and thus, and then very simple units on top. And um, what you can see here is the incline that declines here and then inclines slightly here, but allows them to be connected and to bridge between the two buildings. In fact, because they're fireproof construction, you didn't even need sprinklers, although we do have them. So then they're clad in, in the wonderful brick, Peterson brick from Denmark, you may all know, and then using their third windows. Uh, so, the last I, time I need to do he that. Gets, he gets five dollars for every time he says Dura <laughs> Um But one of the things that the making these simple buildings allowed us to do where my dinner comes from. Okay. was to spend more money on the construction and the materials. So we, could, we got to use this great brick and we made, we also had this idea that if you had an interior courtyard and used a lighter brick, it also would give another dimension to the space. So the plans that we, I hope, will come up. And then we even took this tiny little courtyard, that's certainly no bigger than a third of this room again, and then divided in half, which seems counterintuitive, but it gave us two courtyards. Um, I don't know that there's another plan. Anyway, right, everyone gets a kitchen. Everyone looks into the courtyard. Um, so the students have the kitchen, the courtyard walls, they have ivy growing up them. It's quite light in the center, so you have an interior and an exterior, which is quite nice. Uh, we worked with the students and laid out full-scale rooms and then designed the furniture, very standard furniture, and had it built. But the furniture is sized, and the room is actually sized to the furniture, which would allow standard furniture to be configured in a number of different ways in a tiny room. So we were trying to make sure that the room worked with a kind of quite standard furniture and that the horizontal um, sort of divisions of the window worked when you were either lying in bed or sitting at a desk. So it's really kind of going micro but really thinking about how one can live in a sort of with very simple components, but each thing is considered. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry to say the students keep their shades down as students do, but. Um, I'm sorry. Hey, anyway, right, the hallways are all interesting. We also use the synthetic felt we've been working with in tile to make sure, kind of like an alto, you learn from the masters. It's good to have materials other than sheet rock on the inside of things that get beat up, and so they're in very, very good shape. We made every floor have a different pattern. And there are nice study rooms and so on. Now, you may all know this, or you may not, but I hadn't shown this before. 
here. So we're really thrilled to work in the Logan Center, which we won in the competition. I think it was before, certainly before 2008. And that gave us an entree to Chicago, which I'm sure we wouldn't have the residential center. And I felt very intimidated even thinking about working in Chicago uh, when we first started and still do. But luckily, we're working with IDEA, yeah. um, who are here. Thank you very much, Dina and Paul. So I guess here we're looking downtown. Um, our site is, of course, the University of Chicago, and Chicago wanted to build across the Midway in a way to begin to not only take advantage of the land that they own to the south, but also to begin to reach out to the south and the community of the south side and to begin to, in a way, open themselves up. They also had some very, very interesting intellectual uh, departments, important departments, but they also had arts, but they tended to be buried in small spaces. So this was an idea of consolidating the arts and bringing them together. And our proposal, which was a competition, was it actually looked like this. Um, this was our competition proposal, and, and we won the competition. Kind of silly. Pardon? Kind of silly. It's silly. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. That was, my, that was my idea. Okay, anyway, no, we, we, had, we had lived for 35 years in Carnegie Hall and loved the idea of a Tower of Arts. Uh, and we concept we said, thank you very much, was a tower to represent Chicago and then a horizontal building to represent the plains. It turned out to be a really tough thing to work out though and this fortunately didn't work out this way. Uh, but actually the section is a little closer to what we did and it is mixing together visual arts, performing arts, film, um, and dance. Yeah. And really trying to think about how, where are the places that they would run into each other because that's what the University of Chicago wanted to do. Well, we were lucky that we designed this before 2008, but then unlucky when 2008 came along and then lucky again because people needed to work and we got great contractors and didn't use durotherm windows here. Um, Minus five dollars. Okay. Um, and these photographs were taken by Tom Rossiter, so, so. thank him for that. All right. The, the idea of the building is 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 quite clear. We wanted the we wanted to create a tower and we wanted it to be substantial. As you can see, the other work is made of masonry, almost always concrete and masonry wherever we can. Actually, the uh, Savage was a wood frame building, and the other ones were. Uh, block and precast concrete. This is poured in place concrete and steel. But I, I'm very happy with, again, the mixing of spaces and using outdoor space, which I think is critical, even as we talk about the interior, to make sure the out outdoor space is kind of a binder between two diff different things, whether it's Billy and me, or the, two, two, the fireplace and the, the library, or the existing building and, and the context. That's true, so we really never, try to see buildings as objects, but um, really try to make a relationship and often will separate um, aspects of the building and the landscape is the binder. So you saw that also in um, the dormitories at Haverford, the landscape is the binder for really two extremely simple bars, but the landscape provides the complexity. It's both lucky and unlucky when you win, win a competition. The, the lucky thing is you win the competition the, the unlucky thing is that you usually have to stick with the idea that you had when you, when you did. So, and, and then you have to work it out and it, inevitably, you, you know, you are struggling to achieve the, the aspiration. Anyway, uh, the idea is that circulation is really a crucial part of this building as the bridges between uh, the dorms and Haverford are as the landscape is, so the internal spaces. Stairs are always places to be in the work wherever possible. And everyone, may, may, many of you may know the top performance penthouse, the uh, Logans were enamored of this idea that it could be a space that could transform and, and you could uh, be in the air enjoying music in a, in a, in a group, with a group of people taking a class in a tower. We love the messiness of the building and I'm really pleased to say that five years later, um, it's, it's, it's life is much, much better because they've, in a way, taken it over. Yeah. And the fi final project we're showing is uh, a project we started 
why well, it says 2016 there. We actually started in 2003, uh, and it's kind of consultancy services. This, this was a very strange commission to get because one, we had hardly worked abroad, and one day we were told that an Indian gentleman would like to come by and talk to us about a campus in India, which was, seemed ridiculous to me. Uh, one of these things like, you know. When you used to get faxes from Nigeria, and you would sort of, you could get a lot of money. The young people don't know this, but you would get these faxes and they would come in the middle of the night and they said if you would only um, give your bank account number, they would wire in several hundred thousand dollars. So, they still do that? Um, at any rate, uh, I, I took thought no more of it because I just assumed that was that kind of scamish thing. And I didn't know anybody in India, and I hadn't been there, but the next day these gentlemen in suits appeared, I was in my shorts. Um, and they said, well, you know, and I said, well, I, I've never been there, I don't, I don't, we don't do campuses, we don't know that stuff. At any rate, they did, I said we'll go there and, and meet them, and what we see, and this is now a few years old, but this is the, the campus here, built in a green area, and it's, TCS actually sponsored the New York Marathon. They've become a very powerful company uh, in India and a very fine company. Uh, this is to be their headquarters, although they've grown so large and don't made so many larger campuses, but this is their primary campus. It's outside of Mumbai, and they write software. These are the early drawings that we shared with them, which is typical to show the struggle with trying to find the plan on the left, and then this is the model of the building pretty much as built. It's not complete. They, for whatever reason, run into some Indi in it's Indian happened problem. It's Indian time, Indian yeah, time, Indian which time. is yeah. slow time. Um, but the main uh, highway between Mumbai and Ahmedabad is running in front of this uh, complex, and the first sort of configured buildings um, have a kind of idea, have an, um, Parking garage dug they, below they, it. They had and the idea. I mean, in 2003, spaces. there were their cows wandering the streets and just total chaos. But they believed that India would be soon. Everyone would have cars, and indeed, that's turned out to be true. So, making a 600-car parking garage below grade uh, did work out. Uh, we made it an open-air garage below grade. Um, these are now. Uh, we haven't been there now in two years because. Although this is done and it's planted and, and they're used, 2,300 people are working there. They just haven't got the next phase. So this is just before construction was complete. And uh, we, over the years, have been there nearly 20, 30 times. So uh, one of the great gifts of spending time in India was to be in a country um, where crafts are still very, very powerful. And also where they're often less expensive um, than things that are manufactured. So it gave us an opportunity to think about materials in a way that we haven't been able to think about them um, here in the States. And certainly one of the things we thought about were these jollies, which are really primarily from um, kind of one section of India. Uh, Rajasthan. Uh, essentially, the Ratan Tata said, why don't you go look around India? So we did, and we began to find uh, explore some of the crafts and find a way to embed them in the project. Uh, here they're carving the stone jollies by hand. I, we got up to, uh, to Rajasthan, northern Rajasthan near Pakistan, and I, I saw an incredible total stone building and I asked, completely carved, how much would that cost? He said $100,000. Okay, this could work out. <laughs> um, so we did convince them these were very, very inexpensive, um, done by hand, and we just did a, a, a drawing, and it was carved from both sides. So they took the stone called Dolper, which is a limestone, comes out of the ground rather green and relatively soft, and you carve it within the first few weeks, and then it hardens through oxidization. So although it's super laborious, it also is um, not, a, it's a, not as crazy to carve as you could imagine. Well, and of course, things are changing, so now, uh, when we started out, everything was done by hand, and now they water jet cut a lot of the sort of first big cuts, but they still finish by hand. So it's a very uh, kind of 
beautiful and very organic sense. Well, we, we did the landscape work here that was a sloping site of about 30 feet from one end to the next. And we, the Indians love their trees no matter what, and they don't have a problem with a tree that looks awkward. They simply love their trees, so we tried to keep every tree in place in location and use it no matter what it was, and then carve the land much as we did in the snow show. Um, and so we also said, okay, we understand you have to do your your work in, in air-conditioned spaces, but every time you're not, even though it's incredibly hot and humid, let's step outside and be in the natural air. So literally everything is in the natural air. And the buildings all have their base at, at one level, so because of the monsoons, we wanted to keep their feet dry. So you literally here are walking sort of in the shadow of the retaining walls that hold the existing trees. At the existing and, topography. And what's cool is that every one has natural light, but no one really needs a shade. Um, again, this, has, this wasn't planted at that time, and it's so solidly green now today, I'm sure. So these are the outdoor walkways. You'd step from your station where you're working in the computers behind the glass, and here we could have floor-to-ceiling glass just double glazed, have a, a portal in the top and a water body at the bottom, and you would immediately get convection. So this was just a natural way of getting convection and being in being able to be in the shade primarily with dappled sun and it actually has worked very very well um, I mean I would say the mistake we made here is that I don't actually think that the water is such a critical element because water is precious we probably should not have been doing that we do try to recycle the water but it's it's a water heavy and it shouldn't be uh, that's the one lesson I would learn. I, I think that the idea of all stairways being outside and everything being sh shaded is a good one. So here we were using the old wood of go-downs or, or the old mill buildings um, for uh, as kind of ornamentation and then found a guy that would hammer these uh, copper cylinders and cut holes in them and put lights in the bottom and top. And people really absolutely spend a huge amount of their time out in these outdoor passageways. And see. And the stone is from the south of India, very southern part of India. So, I mean, it's just great to me to see people taking their tiffins out. Or, and, of course, and it's a quite a, well, this is a stupid idea, but it, they did it. I mean, making a swimming pool. I mean, but, again, it's too much water use. But, uh, but it's shaded from the sun, and when the monsoon rains, it goes thundering through that slot in the roof, and it's kind of cool. And it also comes through this these openings. This is just openings. a very little bit of water that comes over this yeah. stone cone. Um, but the pool, again, is maybe not a good idea. Anyway, these, these, these holes that go through the building, which are a little like the snowshoe holes, which we were thinking about then and thought about at Cranbrook many years before, do really work well. Uh, they're uh, they're hand-tiled and, uh, and bring, have beautiful light that comes through them. It's very interesting because um, there are certain villages that actually are formed around a kind of particular craft. So there are villages in India where it's primarily the women who um, are working in a china tile. And so um, as you looked at the patterns um, that people made, you could sort of see and it, the women were sitting on the ground and they were um, sitting next to each other and they were tiling around themselves so there's always a kind of pool of tile and another pool of tile and they were joined together. Well you could you could see the hand strokes in the the, the, the space of the woman who was sitting there. Um, so we end this actually with something we did back in 1983 in, in Rome when I was trying to figure out what to do at, at the American Academy and Billy I don't know it was Billy, I think it was basically Billy that had this idea of making little plaster casts of whatever we would find on the, on the ground. And so we made lots of little plaster casts here, just stuff, this happens to be uh, a blood orange. Uh, the idea of embedding material and collaging things and making sure that things are never singular but are always plural is very, very important in our work and in the, in the buildings. Well, strangely enough, I mean, obviously, you find something that um, you that touches you, and you keep on finding it again in other ways. 
So although this was in 1983, we're still thinking of then about the Michael Heiser pieces. So this idea of a void was very important. And this was actually something that I did, I can't even remember when, but it was an idea right, for what to do with Columbus Circle. Well, Columbus um, Circle was renovated, those of you who have been around a while, and by Lori Olin. I'm going to guess it might have been in the early 2000s, but before that there was a competition. And Billy's drawing was to dig a, ch dig a hole to China. Well, I had grown up. Um, so she definitely wanted to up one up Michael Heiser. <laughs> I was going deep. But the idea was that when I was growing up, there, until I was almost 30, there was no um, diplomatic uh, connection between the United States and China. So I never ha knew my grand parents, I never knew any cousins. You couldn't even mail a letter. Certainly you couldn't make a telephone call. So it was totally cut off. So the story about digging a hole to China always seemed quite amazing to me because it seemed like that would be the only way I could ever uh, get to meet my grandparents. Um, so then when the idea of wh what to do with Columbus Circle came up, I figured, well, that's what Columbus was looking for anyway. Hey, by the way, he, he dropped right through the hole, I guess. Huh? Um, the final images are ha of the hands, and, and the reason we want to end with that, both the bones, because that's the interior of our hands and the structure of our hands, and also the evidence of our hands, is because it, in fact, is many, many hands that makes our, make architecture. It's certainly not just ours. Uh, it's our studio, which is now nearly 40 people, um, but it's the people who build the work and who, who you know, and the people we work for that are, that count. So I, I think we actually appropriately can feel humble to be part of, as architects, part of a much larger world where we're thinking about larger issues uh, in whatever we're doing. It's, a, it's an extraordinary way to study life. Really wants to end with these thoughts. Well, um, I don't know how many of you know the writer Wendell Berry, um, but he's a very, interesting and thoughtful writer um, and he's also a farmer um, but he wrote these words good work finds the way between pride and despair it graces with health and it heals with grace it preserves the given so that it remains a gift by it we lose loneliness we clasp the hands of those who go before us and the hands of those who come after us. We enter the little circle of each other's arms and the larger circle of lovers whose hands are joined in a dance and the larger circle of all creatures passing in and out of life who move also in a dance to a music so subtle and vast that no ear hears it except in fragments. So we're very happy to be in this particular fragment and sharing some time with you. Thank you very much.